let me start by introducing you. So I think actually we first met at CERN many years ago when we were both in the OPAL experiment. And after that, you followed up and uh, became a professor in Manchester and lead there uh, quite a substantial physics group and uh, moved your interest to D0, where uh, you became also spokesman of the experiment. And since some time, you're also quite interested in neutrinos. And uh, I'll have to check here. I think it was with Super Nemo and Microboon and SBND, the short baseline experiments where you were active. But most notably, you're the, uh, I mean, Stefan is the spokesperson of Dune since a few years already. And uh, under this capacity is still in, in Dune itself. And so he's at the, you know, the front line of, of neutrino physics. So we're very happy to have uh, Stefan here to give us three lectures uh, starting today, every day at 11 Central European time. And uh, I think Stefan, if you're ready to go, then you can start sharing the slides. The, the lectures are recorded. Okay. Um, so thanks again for, for inviting me and uh, also, uh, let me just go to full screen and share a second uh, escape. I'm still working with the technology here. Um, I have to go to share. Share screen. Um, view. Uh, desktop share. You see a screen, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, a uh, slideshow. Can you see it now? Not, yeah, we see the slideshow now, it's full screen. Yeah, so okay. I think we're good to go. Um, yeah, thanks again for the invitation. Apologies for being a couple of minutes late for getting this wrong. Fortunately, I was more organized than, uh, um, uh, normally, and I had actually the slides uh, ready, so I just didn't go through them uh, one last time. Uh, so we'll have to do this together. Um, so I guess it's uh, it's about 45 minutes, something like that uh, for today. Is that right, uh, Albert? That's fine, uh, as you like, maximum one hour, but 45 is good, and then yeah, we can have well, plenty of questions. Also Let's see how yeah. slow or fast I talk. Um, and uh, I've called the, the, so the, the title of the, of the lectures is uh, Neutrino uh, at Accelerators, or uh, I slightly renamed it Neutrino Oscillations. I will be mainly talking about uh, neutrinos at accelerators in the in the second and third lecture and today uh, I'll use the first lecture just to introduce neutrino oscillations to set the stage of uh, what we actually um, want to look at and to introduce uh, uh, neutrinos in, in, in general and uh, uh, I know of course that people at CERN know very well what neutrinos are and uh, uh, but for the for the big LHC experiments I usually hear for them it's just missing missing transverse energy and uh, that's what uh, uh, normally a neutrino uh, looks like when you go to Atlas or CMS. Now the neutrinos we are studying here this this is a little bit different. Uh, this picture this beautiful picture is actually taken at CERN uh, that is in the north area. This is the inside of the Protodune uh, experiment, uh, prototype for Dune. Again, I'll talk about Dune more tomorrow, uh, but this shows uh, uh, the, the Protodune cryostat as it looked like before uh, it was uh, filled. So this is about two years ago. So today, um, I, I will mainly talk about what are neutrino oscillations in very general introductory terms and uh, specifically uh, what is the PMNS matrix, because this is largely um, uh, the, 
the set parameter, the set of parameters which we want to understand and measure in, in neutrino experiments. Let me start completely generically uh, uh, for you know, a more generic uh, background where we start out with. We all know, uh, uh, and, and as, you know, CERN, of course, is the place where a lot of this has been studied that uh, the world as we know it is made up of uh, nucleus and, and, and atoms and in the center of the atom is a nucleus which consists of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And uh, this is the basic model with which we can build most of the universe. If you look deeper into the proton and the neutron, we know they are made out of quarks, uh, up and down quarks. And in the, the simplest model, uh, this is uh, just two up quarks and one down quark or vice versa, one up and two down quarks. Now, it was seen very early, uh, already, you know, like almost 100 years ago that uh, the neutron is not stable and decays. And uh, uh, the, the problem people had at the time uh, was that neutrons decayed uh, apparently into uh, uh, just a proton and an electron. If you measured the energy distribution uh, from these decays, you could see that uh, there's it looked like there was missing energy. And at the time, I think today, we would probably not uh, uh, do that anymore. At the time, people were so startled about this that they actually, at some point, were willing to give up energy conservation in, in, in this process. Now, as we all know, the, the solution was proposed uh, by, by Pauli, who... Uh, wrote this famous letter uh, uh, that is now, yeah, we should, in, in only in, in 10 years, we'll have the centennial of this, uh, who wrote this famous letter, which is in, in, in German, uh, to this conference in Tübingen, where he proposes the neutrino as, an, uh, as a solution to the problem. And uh, in this particular case, um, uh, he, he actually calls it neutron, which we now know, and that's a little bit confusing now, no, this is not uh, uh, the particle we are talking about. It's the particle we are talking about here. We now call the, uh, uh, the particle neutrino, and that goes back to Fermi. And uh, because it is in German, uh, I've translated it here just uh, so, so far. I do not dare to publish anything about this idea. So this was quite different from the way we operate today, where we publish usually very, very quickly and trustfully turn first to you, dear radioactive people, with a question of how likely it is to find experimental evidence for such a particle. And of course, that already defines the problem with neutrino experimentation. The problem with neutrino experimentation is that neutrinos are extremely uh, 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 difficult to, uh, to detect. Um, as I said, Enrico Fermi renamed uh, the new particle uh, 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 neutrino, and it was discovered, uh, as expected, in, in, in beta decay uh, from, from reactors uh, in, in the, about 30 years or so after its inception, uh, and about 70 years ago. So this is... Um, in, in, the, in that process uh, shown below. Now, nobody has ever seen a neutrino directly, but the way we detect them is over what they produce. Uh, this is one of the first really visible, uh, first visible display of a neutrino interaction in a, in a bubble chamber kind of interesting for a while, these bubble chamber pictures uh, seemed a little bit old fashioned, uh, uh, even though they are extremely precise. And we are now going back to a new era. And again, I'll talk about this uh, in one of the next lectures in more detail, uh, where, you know, the kind of images we take from, from these uh, interactions look very similar specifically in, in, in liquid argon uh, experiments such as, as Dune. So in a way this looks very modern uh, again. Uh, the 
event you see here is a muon neutrino uh, uh, coming from the right and it produces a proton and a pion and a muon and we recognize and identify these particles basically by their range and by the, the amount of ionization they produce. And again, this is uh, something very similar to what happens in currently in modern uh, liquid, uh, liquid argon detectors. Um, how do we know this is a this is a muon neutrino, so a different type of neutrino from the one uh, we talked about uh, previously in beta decay? Well, because our model of the the way the neutrinos fit into the standard model is is shown here. It's uh, the quarks and the leptons which come in three generations. Uh, the forces uh, which are exchanged by these bosons and the Higgs, of course. Uh, uh, which was discovered at CERN, uh, as we all know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, governing the, the, the mass mechanism. And uh, the neutrinos seem to come in three flavors. And what we call flavor here is actually identified, and for practical purposes, when you do an experiment, this is very important, uh, by the charged lepton it produces. So. When we say this was a muon neutrino, that actually uh, means uh, it produced a muon. Uh, this is how we identify and define the flavor of the, of the, of the neutrino in this interaction. So this is the, the, the general uh, uh, picture, which we all uh, have learned to, to love and cherish. Uh, and the neutrinos fit into this, uh, as I said, in this three generation picture and the, the standard model. They are different in some ways from the other particles because first they are electrically uh, neutral. They are the only fermions, the only matter particles that do not carry any uh, electric charge. Uh, and from the four forces which we, are, uh, which we know, they only interact uh, through the weak force and gravity. And of course, gravity, even though it's important here, uh, is, 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 is very weak for, uh, for neutrinos. So the only force where really we can see neutrino interactions are through the weak force. Um, even though uh, neutrinos appear, you know, ghost-like in ephemera because of their weak interactions, however, they play an extremely important uh, role uh, in, in, in the universe. And this is shown here. This is a picture taken just after the Big Bang. Um, the neutrinos uh, were produced abundantly at the beginning of the universe. And uh, this makes them one of the most abundant or the most abundant matter particle uh, in, in the universe. For, for every proton, neutron, or electron, the universe contains a billion neutrinos left over from the Big Bang. Now, the other source of neutrinos, which is extremely strong and very abundant, and, and the neutrinos hit us from this uh, uh, source, uh, you know, extreme, uh, with an extreme flux is the sun. Uh, the Sun produces 10 to the 38 neutrinos per second uh, by fusion processes, and that means the flux of neutrinos through our fingertips per second is of the order 10 to the 11th uh, uh, neutrinos. And of course, they don't do very much, so uh, we don't really feel that. Another way of understanding the abundance is, or, or, or in, uh, Imagining the abundance of neutrinos uh, is if we take a box of uh, one cubic meter somewhere in the universe, not here where we sit, because there are of course more protons where we sit. Um, we have on average 10 protons and 300 million neutrinos. So as I said, neutrinos are important as they are the most abundant matter particle and thereby actually define uh, you know, a lot of the structure of the universe and how the universe actually looks like. Now, if you want to do neutrino experimentation, we have to find sources of neutrinos, and that is not so, well, it, it's actually somewhat easy, but artificial neutrino sources aren't, uh, of course, 
and that easy to, to build. So let's look at uh, natural neutrino sources uh, first. And the ones I show here all are in some ways related to nuclear processes. On the top left is a supernova. And come back to that in a second. Uh, uh, in a supernova, uh, neutrinos are produced in, in, in large quantities uh, within a few seconds of the supernova happening. Um, and these, these bursts of neutrinos can reach us, but they are, of course, not a reliable source of neutrinos because in order to have an observable flux, a supernova uh, would have to go off, and that happens at least in our vicinity only once every generation or so. The second source of neutrinos is, as I said, the sun, where it's the fusion process. That, by the way, defines that we see actually neutrinos and not antineutrinos uh, from the sun, whereas in other types of nuclear processes, for example, in nuclear reactors, uh, we see the neutrinos from the uh, beta decay. And then there is also another source of neutrinos which comes from the Earth. Uh, I will not talk about those anymore, but uh, geoneutrinos, uh, they come from radioactive decays uh, in, in, in the Earth and can actually be extremely useful for uh, measurements of uh, related to geology, for example. There are also applications for neutrinos coming out of nuclear reactors. Uh, uh, the uh, neutrinos can't be shielded. That gives us the possibility to, to actually verify whether nuclear reactors uh, do what they are supposed to be doing. And it's a whole field of neutrino physics which has been developing over the last years to, uh, to, to, to build detectors that can be used for nuclear verification. The typical energies for all the neutrinos coming from these processes, and this is important to remember, is of the, uh, you know, because they're all of nuclear uh, uh, um, origin, is uh, of the order uh, MeV. And uh, as this is the most abundant source of electron neutrinos, it's not a surprise that this was the source of the uh, discovery uh, of the electron neutrino at the Savannah River power plant in, in, in 1956. Now, this is a little more detail how the sun produces the neutrinos, which, which is relevant for the experimentation we do. The majority of the neutrinos are produced, as you can see on the top, left here in the fusion of, of protons, but there are other processes in this chain where then uh, you form uh, uh, higher uh, elements and they fuse, and these are different branches in this fusion chain. While only a small fraction of the fusion uh, happens with these heavier elements like beryllium or bore, these neutrinos have higher energy and you see the energy spectrum of the neutrinos here, which makes them important for experimentation. This is a log plot uh, and this is the energy here. Since it is easier to see higher energy neutrinos in general uh, than lower energy neutrinos, uh, a lot of the flux which we observe at least uh, uh, historically in experiments comes from uh, this, this rare branch of the uh, fusion process in the sun. This just uh, shows you how the neutrinos are produced in a, in a supernova. Uh, what happens here is um, uh, that the supernova collapses. This, uh, uh, the potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy. And as the star, star falls inward, uh, uh, this uh, gravitational energy has to go somewhere. And that happens uh, through this uh, fusion process where protons and electrons fuse and uh, create a neutron and an uh, electron neutrino. And because these neutrinos only interact weakly, uh, it's really easiest for them to escape, escape. and uh, the amazing thing is that actually a supernova, which uh, is of course also visible in the visible spectrum of the light, produces, emits 99% of its huge binding energy uh, um, 
with, uh, within about 10 seconds in the form of neutrinos, and we'll come back to that. Now, at accelerators, uh, what we do in order to produce neutrinos is, in a way, we mimic another source of natural neutrinos, which we have uh, uh, every day bombarding us, and these are atmospheric uh, uh, neutrinos. The atmospheric neutrinos come from protons or other uh, uh, cosmic ray uh, particles bombarding the upper uh, nuclei in the upper, upper atmosphere and producing pions and also kaons. These pions decay into a muon and a muon neutrino and the muon uh, uh, itself uh, can decay into a positron uh, uh, electron neutrino, an anti-muon neutrino. Um, this already shows us that uh, uh, on average we expect uh, uh, the ratio of muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos from cosmic rays uh, reaching us here to be about uh, uh, two to one. And um, the uh, typical energy, both by uh, produced in accelerators and also of the atmospheric neutrinos, uh, the energy range is something in uh, order GeV. So that's really relevant later when we build detectors, because a lot of the big detectors we build now for neutrinos like uh, uh, Hypercamucanda or, or Dune or so, they, they actually are multi-purpose detectors in terms of using neutrinos, both from accelerators and from uh, uh, natural sources. So we have to cover the whole um, energy range of these uh, neutrinos with their detectors. Uh, it's not a surprise that the muon neutrino was discovered by Lederman Schwartz and uh, Jack Steinberger um, at Brookhaven, uh, in, at an accelerator for that reason, because these are the dominant sources of muon neutrinos. Does it move? Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, now let's look at the overall flux of neutrinos and, uh, uh, for the different neutrino sources. And uh, uh, actually, we'll talk about the cross sections uh, uh, later, probably tomorrow. So these are the different sources uh, which uh, uh, I've talked about. Uh, cosmological neutrinos, uh, uh, they are at very low energy left over from the Big Bang. Solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, reactor neutrinos, terrestrial neutrinos, they are all in this MeV range. And then uh, when we go to atmospheric neutrinos and also neutrinos from uh, accelerators, uh, we are here in this GeV range. If you look at this flux, uh, you see that uh, with increasing energy, the flux goes down, um, which um, uh, is, 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 of course, relevant uh, uh, in terms of the detection probability, and we'll come back to that. Now, before we discuss this in, in more detail, let me say a few words about where it all started. And it started all with the solar neutrinos and with this experiment, which is uh, was located in the Homestake mine in South Dakota. And that happens to be the same mine where now, uh, as we speak, uh, the excavation has started to build uh, the, um, the Dune experiment. And of course, there are also other uh, like double beta decay experiments and so now located in, in, in this uh, deep mine, which is about one mile underground. It's a former gold mine uh, in, in the Black Hills in South Dakota. So Davis was actually a chemist. Uh, he did this experiment in a huge tank um, with 390,000 uh, liters of, uh, which was basically clear cleaning fluid. Uh, which was a cheap way of getting uh, chlor. Uh, and uh, the process there, what you observe is inverse beta decay, where you produce in this uh, liquid uh, uh, argon atoms. Um, the, the threshold energy for this is 0.8 MeV. So that means if you remember the energy spectrum from solar neutrinos that you are actually only sensitive to 
to uh, a small part of the uh, of this branch uh, of spectrum of fusion processes. Now, what he observed, and just to give, you know, it is amazing if you think uh, this experiment ran from 1970 to 1994, something like that, that roughly only one third of the neutrinos were observed as uh, what you expected uh, from the standard uh, solar model, uh, which, which is shown here as a, as a red line. Uh, the way this was done, uh, you filtered the argon out of the liquid and uh, uh, measured the, the uh, argon 37 decay. And just to give you a scale, it meant detecting about five atoms uh, in that uh, grid per, uh, per day. Now, we now know, of course, this was a, a brilliant experiment, but of course, at the time, there was doubts about is this, uh, is, is how reliable this experiment is. Uh, but there were also doubts about the uh, uh, solar model, which um, um, uh, which describes the um, which describes the the way the fusion works in the sun, specifically because these branches. Um, and I still remember conferences I went to where this was uh, discussed that, you know, how reliable are these branches uh, uh, with uh, which only contribute a little bit with heavier elements, because they depend very much, for example, on temperature, and uh, do we get this all right? So is, is there something wrong with the solar model or is a protector effect? So it wasn't as clear as it appears today that this is another, uh, another thing. Now, another important uh, evidence which emerged was that uh, th this experiment is, is, is still around, was the Super Kamiokande, uh, uh, provided by the Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. This is uh, uh, shown here uh, at, uh, you know, it's also underground, like all these experiments normally are underground because of the background from cosmic rays, which you have to uh, uh, get rid of. And uh, it's a huge tank of water. And in this water, uh, um, neutrinos can produce either uh, uh, electrons or uh, muons. And these muons or electrons uh, 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 provide light in this light, uh, they emit light in this light is emitted in what we call a Cherenkov cone. And this Cherenkov cone uh, is detected by a huge number of photomultipliers uh, uh, surrounding this water volume. Now, the measurement the Super Kamu Kandy experiment did, because this was before uh, the accelerator neutrinos going there, was to look at the rate of atmospheric neutrinos as a function of where they were coming from. So this, this picture on the right uh, basically defines the angle, the cosine theta of one is then they come from top, minus one from the bottom. Of course, they can come from any other direction. And depending on where they come from, they will traverse the planet uh, with a different distance. Now, what was observed for the uh, muon-like uh, 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 rings which they observed that compared to the expectation without any loss of muon neutrinos, this wouldn't depend on where we are, uh, and uh, it would look like this blue curve uh, or where they, where they come from. And then what you see is here, there is actually a dependence on, on the angle, so on the amount of material traversed uh, in the Earth. So the question arose, uh, what happens to the neutrinos? Uh, to summarize, only about a third of the expected flux was observed in electron neutrinos from the sun, but it could depend on modeling or detector effects. Atmospheric neutrinos, we see a distance dependence of the disappearance of these neutrinos, uh, which is uh, direct evidence that there's something yeah, that they, they disappear. So the question was, what happens in neutrinos? Perhaps neutrinos are decaying, but we know, of course, that it's the flavor which changes, and we need a mechanism for that, and a complete set of measurements for all flavors to really unambiguously uh, uh, um, demonstrate that. An historic 
in uh, remark this uh, actually the fact that neutrinos can oscillate basically because they are neutral uh, uh, and was was already noticed by Bruno Pontecovo in, in in late 50s this is from his original paper this is often cited um, one shouldn't forget that uh, Pontecovo at the time had no concept of the flavor. So he didn't think about flavor mixing. He saw some uh, um, similar mechanism where he was inspired by the K0 system, uh, which, which was known at the time. Uh, so he hypothesized that the neutrinos actually oscillated between particle and antiparticle states. Now, what is, what's the origin of these oscillations? And I like to show this picture not only because it has the cute animals, but because there are two things that are wrong about this picture, and I'll uh, actually uh, point that out in a minute. Uh, what is important here is if you want to understand neutrinos, is to see uh, to understand that their masses are much much smaller than all their uh, masses of the other particles. They are actually even smaller than what uh, 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 what's shown here because the picture is completely out of date and from what we know now from direct mass measurements, it's more like a fruit fly for all three neutrinos. But it's not zero uh, as we have believed uh, for a long time and many uh, say you know, this is one of the first indications for physics beyond uh, the standard model. Another interesting thing is that neutrino masses uh, are not directly linked to the Higgs boson and the Higgs mechanism, and that's uh, probably the reason why they are so small. They're generated through different mechanisms, which is only indirectly linked to the Higgs boson, which otherwise provides the mass to the fermions and, uh, and also the bosons. The other challenging thing is uh, if somebody's chatting, I can't see the chat. So um, uh, I can see that there's a pop-up. Um, the um, anyway, um, we can perhaps discuss it at the end. Um, their, their small masses make them truly quantum mechanical objects. So the other thing which is wrong about this picture is actually that you should never talk about the mass of an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, or a tau neutrino, because these are the flavor eigenstates. And we know that the flavor eigenstates and the mass eigenstates for neutrinos are not the same. It would actually make more sense if we talked about the neutrinos in terms of their mass eigenstates. And this is shown here where we have the different uh, 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 mass eigenstates, which we label one, two, three, um, and uh, in, in increasing mass. And uh, what, what we know now is that these mass eigenstates and the flavor eigenstates, uh, they, are, they are not the same. And if you talk about a mass, uh, uh, let's say mu one, mu two, mu three, it contains different amounts of the different flavors uh, that uh, we have talked about uh, before. Now, how can we distinguish these different types of neutrinos? It's the measurement we do. If we measure an electron or a muon or a tau, we know it is, uh, uh, it's actually the flavor eigenstates which we observe. So the neutrinos, as they are truly quantum uh, particles because of their, 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 their properties, uh, so how does this flavor oscillation happen from the sun? Um, an electron neutrino emitted by the sun is a combination of, diff, of, of three different uh, mass states. Uh, the corresponding waves will travel with different speeds just because of the, uh, uh, of the different mass. And uh, the waves oscillate at different frequencies because of that and therefore interfere. And uh, the way we observe this is uh, through the fluctuations of the flavors which change back and forth as the waves interfere constructively and uh, destructively on their way to the Earth. And of course, uh, this is a truly quantum mechanical phenomenon. And this picture which we have of particles being little balls flying around in accelerators. And so that truly uh, doesn't work uh, for neut uh, neutrinos. Um, if you do this in a little more quantitative way, 
Um, so we do this by looking at two flavor situation. First, the two flavor situation is easier to deal with because uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a simple uh, rotation, two by two rotation matrix, which uh, rotates or transforms between the flavor states and the mass states. We have labeled the flavor states A, alpha and beta, which could be like uh, electron or mu. And we see this matrix in between, which rotates one vector into the other vector. Uh, and uh, it depends on a single angle uh, theta. If we look at, so this is the wave function uh, of a neutrino at time equals zero, it is just one superposition of the mass eigenstates, uh, which we can just write out uh, from this matrix equation there as new alpha and the new one and new two get weighting factors, which are cosine and the sine. If we, this is the neutrino at time equals zero. If you want to go for the neutrino at uh, any other time, we have to evolve this uh, in, in time. And we do this like with a plane wave and write uh, the plane wave evolution uh, uh, just as the exponent uh, uh, of, with, the, with this exponent of the uh, four vector. And I've just simplified it, assuming the neutrino only uh, propagates in one dimension. So we call that L and that's just the distance and E is the energy. To get uh, the probability to find the other flavor in this, we have to calculate this, uh, uh, this wave function, uh, new, new beta, uh, new T, and we just multiply them and we get this form. And now we approximate because it's highly relativistic, the particle, the energy in this form and also the time as just L over C. And what we get then just multiplying, and this is a really easy, easy exercise to do is that the probability at the end, which is the square of this term is just given by the sine square of two theta. So this is the amplitude of the oscillation is given by this angle and a sine square where we have this all important delta m squared L over 2e. So the oscillation frequency will depend on the mass difference squared between the mass eigenstates, the distance from the source and uh, over the energy. So these are the parameters which we can really um, uh, uh, deal with. And uh, how would that look like? I mean, this is just a simple probability uh, plot as a function of L over E in uh, uh, shown here. So what, how it looks like is uh, you start out with a muon with here an alpha component uh, and it then oscillates as a function of time and the size, the magnitude, the amplitude of that oscillation is given by this term and the frequency is given by this term. So, the problem with the sun was that we had seen that only a third of the neutrinos were there. So can we actually demonstrate that this uh, with an experiment that these neutrinos have really gone into something else? And this was done by the snow experiment, which used heavy water and again, the Cherenkov effect. And the reason this was done is because in order to demonstrate that we can actually see oscillations, we have to not only show that the electron neutrinos have disappeared, but we also have to show that they have gone into something else. So we have to have a positive kind of proof that uh, something else is being observed. And in order to do this, we need a detector that is sensitive not only to electron neutrinos, but also to the other flavors of neutrinos. And that's what the deuteron does for us, uh, the heavy water. It, it provides a, a, a signal for different type of processes. On the left, the charge current interaction, which is sensitive to the electron flavor only. And on the right, elastic scattering, uh, uh, where the neutrinos uh, 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 scatter elastically of an electron, uh, which which has a, a, a flavor, which can happen for all flavors. And even though the new E dominates, it is uh, in a, uh, it's not the only 
flavor that contributes to that process. Interesting about that process is that it actually also helps that it is directionally uh, 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 sensitive, so you can actually point at the sun, which is another good uh, thing. And that's shown on that plot, where you see that the uh, uh, neutrinos come actually more from the sun. In the second phase, this experiment added simple salt, and uh, 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 the salt helped uh, uh, here um, because of the high neutron absorption cross-section, uh, which again gave uh, uh, a different uh, sensitivity to uh, different uh, types of neutrinos. Now they did a complicated uh, combined analysis where they plot on one side the flux. So here on this, on the x-axis, the flux they observe in electron neutrinos and the flux they observe in the two other flavors. And the dependence of these is different. And when you look at the crossing point, you actually get exactly what you expect for um, the uh, for the assumption that the uh, neutrinos uh, uh, oscillate uh, coming from the sun. And this was, yeah, of course, uh, worth another Nobel Prize. Now, I've shown you just the two by two matrix. In reality, we know it's a three by three matrix, and this is called the PMNS matrix. The PMNS matrix can be split into three terms. This is not a unique splitting, but this is the one usually used. And that depend, uh, which has subcomponents, which represent, in this case, in this case, effectively two by two matrices, which, which mix the, uh, uh, the one and two, and here the two and three, and then this matrix element here. This is dominated by what we observe from the sun. So we sometimes call it this mixing angle, the solar mixing angle, where, which mixes the electron neutrinos coming from the sun with nu1 and nu2. This is dominated what we see in, in, in accelerators or at atmospheric neutrinos, and it is mixes where we start with muon neutrinos uh, with the nu tau. This one we haven't talked about, and this is interesting, even though it is expected to be very small, it is because of this little delta here. Uh, the delta is the CP violation phase, which is, of course, the thing we really want to understand now to understand whether there's CP violation in with neutrinos. And uh, uh, the problem, if you look at that matrix, is that this term here is proportional to this sine uh, uh, theta 1, 3. So if this angle is zero, we have a problem. We couldn't measure, <laughs> we wouldn't be sensitive to any delta. So it was a big thing uh, about 10 years ago to me measure this angle uh, in order to determine whether we would have a chance in oscillation experiments to actually see um, uh, uh, CP violation. I can still do a little more. I'm at 45 minutes. Should I do like five? minutes more, is that okay? Five minutes more is fine. Okay. Um, the thing we should not forget is that all I've talked about is uh, neutrinos in uh, the neutrinos in, in vacuum, but in reality, and this is an effect which also will be very important for the long baseline neutrino experiments, which uh, we'll be talking about next time, in reality, neutrinos uh, oscillation work differently when the neutrinos go through matter, which is the sun or for long baseline experiments, the Earth. This is called the MSW effect after Mikhaev, Smirnov, and Wolfenstein, who proposed this originally. And the simple explanation for this, even though the mathematics is complicated, uh, is that neutrinos uh, when they go through matter, they interact uh, 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 differently because of course uh, the matter they go through is well and for the neutrinos is mainly made up of electrons. This effect uh, uh, changes the neutrino uh, oscillation probability significantly. It actually also leads to a difference between neutrinos and antineutrinos because the earth is made or the matter is made of, of matter and not antimatter. Uh, and um, it, 
is an interesting thing that uh, we therefore expect that neutrinos and antineutrinos will actually behave differently in their oscillation probabilities, which is not directly related to CP violation, which is what we want to see, so the difference between uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos at the end. This MSW effect depends on the sine of delta M squared, and it's very large for the sun. You see here the survival probability for electrons as a function of neutrino energy, and for the lower ones, on the, on the, uh, it's, it's not a, a big effect, but you see for neutrinos around 10 MeV, uh, and uh, in, 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 in the higher energy region, this is actually quite a large effect. And so this is something we have to keep in mind also for long baseline experiments. Uh, I can just quickly here, uh, speeding up a little bit, is that this actually also gives us the sign of the delta M squared. So we know that we don't know whether the normal hierarchy is true or the inverted hierarchy, we don't know because we're only sensitive to delta M squares, not to absolute masses. But we, are, we know that uh, the two has to be above the one from that. Um, the thing we haven't talked about is the tau neutrinos. Uh, um, and if you look now at the probability, you know, we talked about muon and electron neutrinos, uh, and that's where accelerators uh, come in actually really for the first time. Um, the uh, tau neutrinos should make up a big part of a, of a neutrino uh, uh, beam uh, when, when, when it oscillates over a certain amount of time. And uh, one interesting thing which has been uh, uh, done at CERN uh, not so long ago was to, to actually find positive proof that the oscillations happen into tau neutrinos. To do this, you needed and this is the first time I talk about a long baseline experiment, you needed a long baseline uh, uh, experiment where the neutrino source is a few hundred kilometers away from, from the detector. You also needed a high energy neutrino beam because the energy of the neutrinos has to be, in this case, 17 GeV, high enough to actually produce a charged tau lepton uh, in order to uh, uh, see that in the events. And that happened in Grand Sasso with the uh, opera experiment, which, which used emulsion targets, which produce, of course, beautiful also representation of these, of these events and which can be used for offline analysis uh, 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 because of, you know, as I said, the number of neutrino action is not so, so high. And this is, in total, they have observed, I think it is six, eight, nine events, something like that. Uh, uh, and uh, um, this appearance of new towers is one of those events uh, which you see here, which shows beautiful positive proof of this uh, uh, oscillation uh, into new tau. Uh, you it's a tau uh, that goes into pi minus and a pi zero, and you see the gamma one and the gamma two from the pi zero decay. So, that's what we know now, and um, the matrix is shown here. We have the solar and the atmospheric, and what we haven't talked about yet is the reactor. Uh, that's what uh, uh, we often call the matrix in the middle, which is absolutely crucial if we want to do long baseline neutrino experiments at, at accelerators, because it gives us the... Um, sensitivity to the phase delta, which we, um, uh, which we want to measure in, in these experiments. And uh, I'll probably stop here and uh, then continue with that tomorrow. Okay, Stefan, thanks a lot for this uh, nice introduction and setting the scene of what we're still going to see in the, the next lectures. So at this point, we do have some time for uh, questions. And the procedure we have is you raise your hands and then we go in the order of questions as they come in. So um, questions, please. Uh, yeah, so on. 
Uh, sir, what is the difference? I mean, how were the cosmogenic neutrinos created? I couldn't understand what you said. Sorry. Uh, the in the in the uh, beginning slides you showed a graph of how different energy uh, neutrinos uh, reduce the flux reduces as the energy of the neutrinos increases. Mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, one of the uh, term was the cosmogenic neutrinos. Uh, how is those created? Oh, the cosmogenic neutrinos are neutrinos that are left over from the uh, uh, Big Bang, at the, uh, from the processes that happened uh, at the creation of the universe. So you have other, so you have two type of, uh, um, uh, you know, if you want uh, astrophysical uh, uh, or uh, cosmological sources of neutrinos and the two energy extreme uh, uh, ends of the uh, energy spectrum. Um, so um, the, the ones uh, at uh, low energies come from it, the Big Bang and processes uh, where the neutrinos were created originally, and then their energy basically in a similar way as for the cosmic microwave background. Uh, you know their their energy got diluted and uh, they um, they show up at the lower end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you can have um, you know very violent uh, uh, events in in uh, in the universe, uh, high energy which produce extremely high energy cosmic rays. And these high energy cosmic rays uh, in these processes can also produce neutrinos. Of, of extremely large energy. Uh, they are very rare, but there are experiments like the ice cube experiment at the South Pole that can actually measure and has actually recently measured some neutrinos at these extremely high uh, uh, energies. If, if I can follow up actually on the cosmological ones, uh, they are of course, very difficult to measure and we, we don't have any measurements on that yet because they're in sub electron volt scales and the cross sections are very, very low. But are there, are there any ideas around that you know of to, to try to check that and see that? Because this would be a CMB, but, but it would be a CMB coming from really the, uh, the Big Bang, let's say, and not some few hundred thousand years after, like, like the one we have from light. And, and so go deeper into understanding maybe what the Big Bang could be. I mean, there are experiments that can measure, uh, well, that, that uh, uh, people are thinking about, uh, uh, which has a large overlap with experiments you can do for dark matter detection at very low, um, uh, you know, at very uh, low masses. So, but it is, uh, you know, it's a very difficult, uh, uh, thing because you know have to the sensitivity of such experiments has to be extremely uh, um, good and you know background problems and things like that are uh, uh, but there are you know people thinking about these kind of experiments would be an interesting lecture yeah yeah right or for young people listening to these lectures of course if they you know after your lectures get some ideas of what experimental techniques one could think of mm. uh, that could make a nice career um, other questions? Magnus. Yes, uh, it's a follow-up question um, on the same topic. Um, I wanted to understand um, from you if this cosmological neutrino cross-section as this, of course, it's a calculation, uh, I assume? These are all, this is calculational. I mean, I took this from, you can actually, uh, I put the reference there, yeah? Um, so um, these these fluxes, this is not a cross-section. The, the word cross-section up there is, uh, right. should, not, should not be there. Uh, it's, um, actually I have a different slide where I wanted to show the cross-sections uh, uh, also. And what happens with the cross-section is that they go in the absolute other direct, they go in the other direction. They increase with energy, uh, which is exactly the experimental problem. So the, 
I don't know whether you can see the pointer, but if you look at the cross-section plot, it would go this way. Yeah? Uh, it almost it rises with neutrino energy. And so this makes it actually easier to some extent to find these. But the problem here is the flux is high, the cross-section is tiny. Yeah? Well, I mean, the flux is normalized to MeV, right? I think if one normalizes this, if one removes the normalization, the flux is not so high anymore. And I, yeah. Um, well, there's the um, coherent neutrino scattering, right, at low energies that should have a higher cross-section. Yeah, so the, it, at low energies, at lowest energies, the process is coherent scattering, yeah? Exactly. And uh, uh, so that's why I said the kind of experiments you would have to do are similar experiments to dark matter experiments for low, for very low uh, dark matter, where you would see some, you have to see some kind of recoil, but the recoil is, um, is going to be very, very small. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, I would like to ask, uh, given that we have oscillations from uh, uh, muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos or uh, rest, mm -hmm. what this uh, signify that we have lepton flavor violation, what this would uh, mean for uh, physics beyond the standard model? Well, as this is a lepton flavor, it's not lepton. Uh, um, uh, number violation, and in this case, we only talk about uh, uh, lepton flavor violation, as you correctly point out. Now, uh, in terms of uh, lepton number violation, if that is observed, and there are experiments uh, with neutrinos that uh, you can do, of course, and the process where this would really become relevant is, for example, a neutrinos double beta decay. Um, then this this would of course be clearly an indication of physics uh, uh, beyond the standard model. I mean, so I think probably the best way to look at lepton or to search for lepton number violation in in in, in neutrino physics is to go and look for neutrinoless double beta decay, decay, which would be an indication that neutrinos are Majorana particles. Mm -hmm. hmm? Okay, thank you. I have a question on, on slide 46, I think it was, because it went quick and maybe it was there, but I didn't Yeah, because see. I was starting to get nervous about time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Oops. Oops, sorry, no, oops. It's difficult to get there. So it didn't quite actually say, but the black line is the town neutrino? Or no, the blacks the are the new E's. Um, okay, so. I so went what, to what so, the colors. Hmm? So uh, it starts out uh, with a muon neutrino beam. This is this uh, the initial muon neutrino beam. Uh, uh, the black. So you see actually uh, the slow rise of the new E, and you see that in a long baseline experiment, new E appearance is a very small effect. Uh, I mean, we'll talk about this in more detail. So the black is the new E. And let's say this is a GV. This is, this is like uh, Dune or, or something like that. Let's say we produce one GV neutrinos. So we can use the kilometers here. So at um, uh, Dune is roughly at 1,300 kilometers, something like that. And uh, so you see the fluctuations between Yu Mu and Yu Tao, uh, and you see the the electron appearance is a small effect, yeah? So we'll only uh, see a few of these. Um, the new taus we don't see because the energy of these neutrinos isn't high enough. You have to go to the CN, you know, the CNGS beam at CERN had 17 GV neutrinos on average. That's enough to get a charged, to produce a tau lepton, yeah? But uh, if you go to the, GEV type neutrino beams we normally have. People have looked at it at the high end of the spectrum. There will be a few new towers you could see, but it's a really, really small number as far as I know. 
but given enough energy, it's really between uh, muons and tau neutrinos that you see the oscillation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't? Yes, yeah, okay. No, no, I want to stress because there were no, mm. uh, no, no, no labels on, for the curves. Okay, good. All right, any further questions? Valent has a question. Oh, and okay. Corinne and Sohan later. Okay, let's let's uh, take these three still, and then uh, we call it today. But Balint, go ahead. Ah, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for this nice uh, presentation, Stefan. I had a question about uh, there is this recently there is this hot topic of multi messenger astronomy, mm -hmm. in which somehow, if we would be lucky enough, there would be a process that would end up uh, emitting gravitational waves and uh, uh, gammas and also perhaps neutrinos. And I was just wondering, I mean, um, given that now the sensitivity to detect gravitational waves is kind of increased with all these gravitational wave experiments, is there an expectation on like, uh, or a constraint on the frequency of events that could lead to multi-messenger events that would also involve neutrinos? So I, I don't know, but I mean, of course, where there's a quantitative uh, um, uh, model that, that predicts that I, I'm not aware, but it is definitely true that IceCube have looked for neutrinos in, um, in, in coincidence with gravitational wave observations. And uh, I have to admit, I haven't looked at it recently, but my uh, impression was that, you know, this wasn't very conclusive uh, uh, at this point. And uh, uh, perhaps somebody who is on IceCube can, can say something about that, but there is no strong indication yet of any uh, coincidence between neutrinos from uh, uh, IceCube seas and gravitational wave sources. Uh, it's of course very difficult because the directionality isn't that great. The, you know, the precision with which you measure this is is not very great in in in, in an experiment ice cube, and the rate is of course also a, a, a problem. You know, you will see very few neutrinos, if at all. Thank so you. I, uh, in terms of models, I think people expect it, but I wouldn't be able to say. Um, it would be an interesting, but you know, uh, for, for a talk on on Ice Cube, uh, to to it would be interesting to uh, understand whether the kind of observations we have now already rule out some models or not. Thank you. To add on that, there are indeed papers written on that to suggest that as something to be looked at, but I think they would want to wait for or would need the precision of like an Einstein telescope or so to uh, to get better information where, where to look exactly. And so far, well, like Stefan, uh, I am not aware of any real experimental effort so far yet, but, but there are ideas. Corinne. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I was maybe inattentive for a while, but you, you said that MSW, MS, yeah, w mechanism is sensitive to delta to the sign of delta m square. Yeah. And how this is, can, is this used to uh, um, decide between the, the inverted mass hierarchy or not? So this is used on the, um, where is it? Uh, No, uh, it, the solar, what it is used for here is because in principle, we have another ambiguity here, yeah? Uh, yes, which is, uh, and remember this is the solar, the solar um, mixing. So the uh, uh, solar oscillation. So, you know, new one could be over new two. The fact that we always have new one and new two in that order, that's given by the solar MSW effect. Um, the uh, the oscillations in long baseline, and we'll talk about this. Uh, of course, op, uh, where whether we observe MSW or not depends on how long the baseline is. So, an experiment like Dune has a baseline of a thousand kilometer, and like Hyper K has two hundred or three hundred kilometers. And so, in Hyper K, 
The short answer is in hyper K, they don't see an MSW effect, whereas in Dune, you will see it. And that exactly will help you to determine the mass hierarchy in Dune, which you cannot do in hyper K, at least not easily. And that is due to the, to the effect of the oscillations through the Earth. So yes, it can also determine the hierarchy uh, uh, if you do uh, long baseline experiments over long enough distances. The longer, the better. Thank you. Last question, so uh, Sir, what, is, what does the delta M mean? Delta M? Yes. Delta M is, so the, we have those mass eigenstates, which I've shown somewhere here and uh, can find them uh, here. And the delta M is just the mass difference. So the mass only, we only have three masses here. There is no electron neutrino mass or something like that. The masses we have are M1, M2, and M3. And the oscillations between these states are governed by their mass differences. That gives you the frequency, basically, and with which they oscillate. Um, high frequency, low frequency. And uh, because it is appearing in that equation, which I showed as delta m squared, it doesn't give you information on the absolute mass of the neutrinos. I haven't talked about that at all. And it also doesn't normally give you information about the sign, whether one or two are like this or the other way around. And that's what we just talked about with the MSW effect. That's one way of getting the mass ordering sorted out. Thanks, Stefan. I see one late popping question. Are you still ready to take that oh, yeah. before we go? Okay. Don't forget, I Thank thought. It, I, I thought it starts in 50 minutes, so. Uh. <laughs> oh, yes, another one hour and something. Yeah, okay. So, Egerant, uh, your question. Okay, um, sorry, can I speak French, please? Mm, my French is not very good. Uh, uh, okay, I'll, well, I'm trying to uh, speak English. Mm -hmm. So, if uh, in the start of your presentation, you uh, was speak, um, the Big Bang uh, was, has created the, the matter, mm -hmm. but where, uh, uh, how, where and how the antimatter there was created because uh, the a AMS detector on the international uh, mm -hmm. uh, spatial Mm -hmm. Space station, yeah. Space station uh, has, uh, uh, has detected the anti-hydrogen uh, atom. Yeah, so this is a, yeah, so this is an interesting thing, of course, that people uh, are looking for the origin of uh, very, very small uh, uh, amounts of antimatter uh, that could be still there with the with the AMS experiment, but the model we have here is that really the universe was created in a symmetric state of matter and antimatter, and that almost all of it annihilated at the beginning in processes which are symmetric between particles and antiparticles. Any asymmetry between them would be due to what we'll talk about next, what we call CP violation. So a difference in the behavior between matter uh, and antimatter. Um, it would be very interesting if, so this is usually defined in terms of elementary particle. Of course, if we observed more complex uh, uh, objects, they would have to be created as anti anti-objects, like an anti-nucleus or something like that, anti-helium, they would have to be produced later and not during the Big Bang because the energy density at the Big Bang was so extreme that you know, a helium atom wouldn't survive this. So this has to be in processes which happened at some later stage. 
Ok. Thank you very much. All right, Stefan. Thanks a lot. And uh, to Stefan and to everybody, uh, tomorrow we have lecture number two starting at 11. So thanks a lot and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, sir.